Hi, and welcome to the Brookdale Visiting Writers Series here at Brookdale Community College. My name is Suzanne Parker. I'm part of the English faculty here at Brookdale, and I'm also the director of the Visiting Writers Series. Today I'm talking with the poet Ken Hart. Ken is the author of the book Uh-Oh uh -oh Time, which just won the Anhinga First Book Award. He is a New Jersey poet, and he has published in numerous journals and is also a writing instructor at NYU. So, Ken, welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, congrats on the book. This is your first book getting published, right? Yes, it is. What has that experience been like? Um, well, it's so new that I don't really know yet. Um, I found out that the book was, book was accepted a year ago, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of elation. And uh, Did you I was, go to the rooftops and just start yelling? Um, more or less. You know, <laughs> it, I was home alone when I got the phone call, and it was, it was a pretty great experience because I've been working on versions of the book for, you know, many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, now that it's out, I'm still in the, uh, you know, stage of like having a new child, and I just <laughs> want to look at it a lot. But I, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not thinking yet about which colleges to send it to. <laughs> well, it, it is a wonderful book. It's an absolutely wonderful book. Now, you said you'd actually been working on the manuscript for a while. Um, and I actually know this because, being a friend, I had a chance to actually look at an earlier version of this manuscript. Mm -hmm. um, and it's changed. I mean, it definitely has. Can you kind of talk about that process, kind of a before and after, how it evolved, what changed in it? Well, I went to Warren Wilson College for my MFA um, degree and that was I finished there 10 years ago in 1998 mm -hmm. and when you leave there you you leave with a thesis manuscript mm -hmm. and I foolishly tried to send that out and and get it published and you say foolishly now because because I, I I'm I wouldn't want that to be published I mean <laughs> you know it was it wasn't ready yeah. and um, over the 10 years between then and now, mm -hmm. I just kept writing new poems and revising the ones I had. Mm -hmm. And I would say every year or two, I just kept taking it apart, putting it back together, taking mm -hmm. old poems out, putting new poems in. And in the last few years, it started getting better attention and then finally it got taken. And not just taken, but won the Enhinga First Book Award, which right. is a, a wonderful prize. Mm -hmm. So I guess the message in this is for, for people who are writers who are watching, the message is revise, 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 or don't give up. Yeah, <laughs> patience. And, you know, um, I think it really also has, to, there's so much competition out there these days um, mm -hmm. with, you know, there'll be a first book contest and they'll get four, five, six hundred manuscripts, and they mm -hmm. can only choose one. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think people should feel bad if they don't get chosen because it just, it has a lot to do with, you know, who's reading what, when, and how it all shakes out. I don't mean to, you know, disparage the book, but I also know that there's a lot of terrific writers that I've seen out there that are just, you know, almost getting there for many years. and. I, you know. Just, just keep trying. Yeah. Just keep yeah. getting out yeah. there. Well, can you talk about the book a bit? I mean, are there any kind of, is there a unifying arc or any themes that you found you continued going back to to explore in these poems? Um, yes, probably themes of uh, relationships between men and women. Um, that was something I, I'm naturally drawn to writing about. And there do, there do seem to be a lot of, I dumped her, she dumped me, we went out on a first date, and I'm wet, waiting to get that call, so you're probably <laughs> dead poems in there. <laughs> well, you know, that is, that's a, um, that's kind of medicine. You know, when you, when you have the wound, uh, you lick the wound, or you apply medicine, and sometimes for me that, uh, like, like most young people starting out writing, in high school I see this, the writing out of this sort of pain or mm -hmm. um, difficulty, and that's when they write. Um, and I have many more poems that I wrote in those circumstances, but I didn't want it, the book to be overwhelmed by that, so mm -hmm. I decided, well, let me just keep the best ones. 
and then I can develop other muscles, uh, so to speak, and write about, um, you know, political issues mm -hmm. or family issues or um, nature or society. And, and hopefully they all speak to each other in one way or another in the book, but I would say that's a more of a dominant theme than others. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's great. I think it's like, it's, it's the, the male, this is going to sound awful, but it's like the, the male poetry guide to dating book kind of in a way. Well, maybe that'll make more, more males buy it. Put, put it up that way in Amazon. <laughs> um, what, one of the things I love about this book, though, is that you seem to push the envelope of acceptable subjects. You have poems about, you know, Russian pole dancers, about a man buying porn, poems that address issues of race, or there's one poem where, referring to a former student, you talk about, you know, quote, making yourself available. Um, it seems like, you know, these, these poems live in an uncomfortable place. And it's, it seems to me in your work, you're, you're often going there and then and staying in that place to sort of explore. Is that something, you know, that you're striving for in your work? I think it's something I've learned to strive for. Mm -hmm. I didn't go in deciding to be a poet um, and then having that happen. Um, Tony Hoagland, who's here tonight, was also a, he was my first teacher in graduate school. He's one of the people that gave me permission to, mm -hmm. you know, push the envelope, as you say. And with those, you know, I always think back to what Allen Ginsberg said when he, were, when he first wrote Howl, mm -hmm. which is he didn't have any intention of showing it to anyone. And then he began to, and he gained confidence because he got a good response from it. Mm -hmm. And I think with those topics that you mentioned, um, I felt uncomfortable writing about them. Did you? Um, yeah. And then I thought, well, I, I, I can't, you know, I explore, the, I, I can't do anything with these besides leave them in my notebook. But then once I got some distance, and then I got, I went, they went through a lot of revisions, so they weren't simply me confessing. Mm -hmm. um, I made things up, I changed names. Um, sometimes I would say I when it was a story I heard from elsewhere and then mm -hmm. I changed all the details. And as a result, um, I think there's a little part of me that it, 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 it's, it wants to make people a little uncomfortable, hmm. but also want to read forward, not for the shock value, but just so that it can try to access something that we've all gone through. If a man goes to um, at, at, to uh, a, a go-go bar, mm -hmm. um, what kind of experience is that that uh, he has and that the people have there that may not be being, being written about so much in poetry? Mm -hmm. Do you think that's important? I mean, do you think that's for poetry today to, to discomfort people, to move people outside their zones? Yeah, I don't think the end result is yeah. to make them uncomfortable as much as, it, you know, um, shake things up a little bit, mm -hmm. um, move them outside of their zones, but then don't leave them lost. Hopefully bring something else in so the poem isn't simply about an uncomfortable event, mm -hmm. that it's ultimately about some kind of human event. Well, that actually makes me think of, <clears throat> I know that when talking about the book, I had read that you um, are interested in, I think it's called narrated meditations. Yeah. So, can you talk about that, what you mean by that? Well... Um, simply, it's, it's trying to tell some sort of story while thinking your way through it mm -hmm. and commenting on the story that you're telling while you're telling it. Um, one of my favorite poems is by D.H. Lawrence called Snake, mm. and it moves back and forth between abstraction and narration, and he eventually comes to understand both something about himself and this snake that he's watching. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm very attracted to that idea of that moving back and forth between story and, and lyric or, or talking out loud, thinking out loud. Well, well, this places you, I think, very comfortably in the middle of kind of contemporary poetry today that does that a lot. Um, some does. You yeah. know, some is more fragmented and, mm -hmm. and more difficult, yeah. Have you found that your work has gotten more fragmented with time? Not fragmented, uh, but 
but I am, I do feel willing to take more uh, lateral leaps rather mm -hmm. than go in a cr more chronological order. Going across from that. Who are you reading? Or who were you reading when you were writing this book? Well, over 10 years, a lot of people. Oh, that's true. You know, um, <laughs> well, actually, actually, more interesting than it was there somebody you were reading who was influencing that stage of the manuscript? Well, as I mentioned, Tony Hoagland has mm -hmm. been um, not only a friend, but an influence. Um, How so? Well, um, he, in terms of talking about contemporary issues, mm -hmm. about um, men and men and women um, in a contemporary way, in an adult way, um, and also broadening it out to talking about culture, um, but so many poets, um, you know, I, 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 I once heard a poet say there's, there's um, one type of, of studying which is mm -hmm. uh, where you just follow one writer for years, mm -hmm. um, and then there's others that, um, are, you know, are always picking from different places, and I'm more of the latter type. So, mm -hmm. You know, everyone from Walt Whitman up to, you know, a poem that was published yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, mostly American, though, yeah. in the past hundred years. Well, I see a lot of similarity between your works and Tony Hoagland's, who, as you said um, in this evening's reading at the uh, Visiting Writer Series, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to have come out. I mean, he too, particularly in his first two books, um, addresses issues of masculinity and the place of the man in the larger world. Um, and that seems to be a really strong theme and concern throughout your book as well, is, is the placement of the masculine in a way. And I'm wondering if there are any poems that didn't make it into the book. They were too much, too strong, too, I don't think I can really say that and have people still respond positively. No, it was, it was never that sort of thing. Um, I, I made the final choice based on the writing. Mm -hmm. So if something was a difficult, challenging subject, um, the only reason it made it in was because I and other people I showed the poems, mm -hmm. the poem to, thought it was working as a poem, as writing. Um, but it, it wasn't like there was, you know, subject matter was off limits. That hasn't happened yet. <laughs> yet. <laughs> um, well, we're going to take a short break and okay. then we'll be back. I'm talking with Ken Hart and this is the Brookdale Visiting Writer Series. <laughs> within our lifetime? At Rotary, we believe it does. We've created programs at universities around the world dedicated solely to teaching peace to a new generation. There's a new symbol for peace. Rotary. Brookdale's main campus is in Lincroft. We also have higher education centers located throughout Monmouth County. The Western Monmouth Branch Campus in Freehold. The Eastern Monmouth Higher Education Center in Neptune. The Northern Monmouth Higher Education Center in Hazlitt. The Long Branch Higher Education Center. The Wall Higher Education Center and home of the New Jersey Coastal University. Higher education centers give you the flexibility you need to get your education. Hi, and welcome back to the Brookdale Visiting Writers Series. My name is Suzanne Parker, and I'm speaking with the poet Ken Hart, whose first book, Uh-Oh Time, is just out from Anhinga Press, where it won the first book award. So welcome back. Welcome back. Now, we were talking um, during break about the beautiful book that you have here and the design, and you were talking about the fact that Anhinga Press gave you a choice of, of glossy or matte. And I just <laughs> want to know why you chose glossy. 
Uh, I just thought it would go better with the bold colors on the title. Is that what it was? That was it was. Um, I love the cover art. Did they let you choose this? I chose this. And could you kind of, why? Just because it was cool or? Uh, I'd looked at a lot of things and some of them were too difficult to obtain because mm -hmm. they were famous paintings. So I started searching for lesser known painters, going to galleries, looking online, looking mm -hmm. at books. And as soon as I saw this, it struck me partly for its, its strangeness. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's two people sitting on uh, a giant bird holding instruments. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that there was, the, the key was the fact that there was a couple. Mm -hmm. And as we spoke before about the, uh, <coughs> the number of relationship poems in the book, I mm -hmm. thought it's good that there's a man and a woman on the cover. Oh, great. It is a wonderful cover. It's a beautiful book. Um, we were talking before the break about um, one of the larger themes in the book is about relationships and negotiating, navigating those relationships. And I'm wondering if you would uh, talk about Uh-Oh Time, the title poem in the collection, and maybe read it for us? Sure. Um, like a lot of my poems, it starts out with uh, maybe a phrase in my head and also some sense of me being uncomfortable in a situation mm -hmm. that if all the stars are aligned seems ripe for exploring in terms of um, poetic material. So I'm just going to interrupt you for one sec because I find that really interesting what you said. So is that where you find the impulse for a lot of your poems, something that is causing you concern or discomfort? Uh, yeah, it, I mean it doesn't mean that every time I, I, I'm in a position like that, I write a poem, yeah. it just seems like enough things are kind of pushing against each other mm. that inside me, uh, that, that maybe um, I have a, an opportunity here. Mm -hmm. I certainly write at times when I'm very calm and peaceful mm -hmm. as well, but um, I feel as if I pay attention to those moments and I'm lucky enough to find the words to, to combine with those mm -hmm. moments then something more interesting can come out of them than if I were just describing the trees in my yard or something. Okay, great. Did you have more you wanted to say to introduce the poem? Um, probably, you know, it, it probably introduces itself because I think it's clear. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it moves quickly. It's, I, I think of it as both a serious and a humorous poem mm -hmm. um, that tries to deal with um, being caught in a relation, a situation, in this case for a man, um, where he has to make a choice and he doesn't know what to do. So mm -hmm. I'll read the poem. Great. It's called Uh-Oh Time. It's uh-oh time again when a woman asks me out after a year of being on my own and her number on the bar napkin is the permission slip to stop hating myself. Stop walking around all day in sweatpants. Stop leaving a nest of dental floss stuck to the tiles where it missed the garbage can. I've got to start taking better care of myself, is what her voice on the answering machine suggests. Got to get back on the Stairmaster. <coughs> got to learn new recipes. It seems the moons of Venus have entered a new phase and offered the consideration that selfhood is no longer to be found in the bathroom mirror. And because Venus is such a poor dissembler of her gifts, because the memo she sent to Club Eros said simply to put me on the list that it's my turn for the bouncer to nod his head and unclick the brass clip on the velvet rope, rather than a flower, a bouquet, rather than one date, two this Saturday night. You might think this a pitiful state of affairs to complain about or shake your head in French that Americans are such poor beneficiaries of an experience we have no translation for. But I can hear the soft click and the low boop and crackle of static across the TV screen of some immortal as she lies on her grape-stuffed belly. The episodes of my past fuck-ups fresh in her mind, and tunes in as I glance at my wristwatch after dinner 
and say, I'll call you, then turn my shoes towards the next possibility, practicing a new name on my lips. Hmm. Practicing a new name on my lips. That's a wonderful last line. Mm. I love that poem because it really is. It, it's about relationships, but it's also got a hopeful tone. You know, it's looking towards the future. And I think that uh, the poems in this book are in the end hopeful, that this speaker mm. throughout the book kind of, th although doing a lot of breaking up and mm. being broken up with and not, you know, all that stuff, um, there seems to be a hopeful tone, mm. hopeful tone in it. Um, well, another thing I find interesting about that poem is the lines are staggered um, in a way that they aren't throughout most, most of the books. When you look at your lines, you know, you're usually writing in relatively, you know, there's a lot of diversity, actually. One long stanza, quatrains, tercets. But in this, you have the staggered lines. And I wonder where the impulse came in this poem for that. Well, not only the staggered line, but an earlier version of that yeah. poem had uh, no punctuation. Huh? And I Which think, is unusual for you. I think I still read it without punctuation because it feels kind of caught up mm -hmm. and breathless. And I think the staggered lines create some of that frenzied mm -hmm. atmosphere of the situation where the speaker is, you know, it's, it's, it's a dangerous moment. It's, it's, mm. it's a moment where uh, he's not sure... He's, he's being pulled in two different directions. Mm -hmm. And I think typographically it works that way. Hmm. Well, this actually makes me think about your language. Um, you know, I, reading a Ken Hart book, it's like, it's kind of like sitting down for, for a good beer with, you know, a friend who you love talking to, is kind of funny and just really, really very well spoken. You know, mm -hmm. there's an ease with your language. It, it invites the reader in. Um, I know that the poet Tony Hoagland has talked about how natural seeming, how unpretentious your language and your lines are. Um, is that something you strive for? I mean, you really do, you don't block the reader out. You invite the reader in. And a lot of it, I think, comes through, through the language, the lines, the form. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I grew up in a blue collar family. My father's a roofer. Um, I work part-time for my father as a roofer. And as a result of that, I was used to that regular guy atmosphere, whether it's mm -hmm. on the job site, getting to and from the job site, going to the bar and having a beer afterwards. So that's the world I came from uh, before I went off and left home to go to college and mm -hmm. so forth. And so you feel that that's, you want these, are you, do you, are you striving to make these poems accessible to people who may not be reading poetry, or is it just sort of the natural language and that syntax that you're working in? Um, it's an easy answer, I think, both. You know, mm -hmm. It does feel natural to me. It doesn't feel like I'm inventing mm -hmm. uh, a self to um, be some kind of you know, blue-collar worker that I'm not. Mm -hmm. At the same time... Um, I know that that's what I'm drawn to in other poems, and I notice that uh, if it is able to speak to an audience that isn't reading poetry and they can gain greater access to it because of that, then you know maybe I'm doing mm. part of my job there. Well, there is the is it the poem Nat and Forest? Is that right? That's a wonderful poem about being young and, and roofing as well. I mean, that's addressed in some of the poems in here. Yeah, yeah, that poem talks about, you know, what it's like, what it was like in the early days to um, work with other older men, roofers, <coughs> uh, and also negotiate the, the mm -hmm. space between the roo roofers and the boss, mm -hmm. which happened to be my father. Hmm. Hmm. Um. I was going to ask what your father thinks of the book, but I won't. I'm sure he loves it. Uh, what is your writing process? Are you uh, up at 5 a.m., got to put in four hours, and I'm going to, you know, go up on the roof kind of writer? Uh, I do that sometimes. I, I wouldn't say 5 a.m. quite, although <laughs> uh, when, when, when the days start getting really lighter in the spring, mm -hmm. I get up earlier and earlier to write before I go off and, and, and look at roofing jobs. Um, one time I almost never write is the afternoon. That, that's when I have my energy dip. But Snap early time. morning, late at night um, are, are good times for me. 
Are you, are you one of those people who needs to write every day, though? You know, I will write. I will get my butt in the chair, and I don't care if I'm producing or not. No, I, I, I go back and forth. You know, during good writing times, when I'm writing every day for weeks or, mm -hmm. or months at a time, it just keeps going. It, it, mm -hmm. it, it's almost like exercise. You know, you, 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 you resist going in the beginning, and then you get there, and you're winded, and you're sore, and you don't like it for the first few days. But then you get to a place where you can't wait to get back because mm -hmm. there's this stuff waiting for you there. And, and I love getting to that period, but it, it never lasts forever. Then it wanes and then mm -hmm. it comes back. Sure. How important to you is a community of writers? I know that you have worked with the Dodge Poetry Festival and the Foundation, and I believe you've done Poets in the Schools through yes. that as well. Mm -hmm. And um, were, did you do poets, Poetry in the Prisons? Uh, or short I, stories. I have done that, some, some of that work, yes. Yeah. Um, what is that like? Well, they're all very different. Um, you know, when you're bringing literature, whether it's, uh, well, when you're bringing literature into an arena where they're not used to having much mm -hmm. access to it, there's a lot of resistance at first. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's a halfway house or a prison, um, then you have to gain their trust. They, they, they generally are, are very suspicious mm -hmm. of you coming in from the outside. Um, so it takes a while. Do you find that it feeds your own writing? Um, in some ways, yes, but yeah. I, think it feel, I feel like everything feeds my own writing. Mm -hmm. It's just that moment rather than you know, something that can always produce. Well, that makes sense, because when I think about your work in this book, a, you know, there's poems about bugs. There's poems about taking a tick off your dog. I mean, mm -hmm. so many of the poems are, are based in the everyday and then become just these, these beautiful expressions, these beautiful, thoughtful evocations. Mm -hmm. and, and I love, that is one of the things I really love about this book is I think it's accessible to anybody mm -hmm. because it, it's a book of empathy and a book of observation, mm -hmm. um, which I think is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Again, it is, uh, I've been talking with Ken Hart, whose book is called Uh-Oh Time. Um, it has been a pleasure. And this has been the Brookdale Visiting Writer Series show. And please do watch us again. <laughs>